reasons. And that those types of uh, conditions are more prone to uh, forest fire. So again, it's a kind of a vicious cycle uh, here. So some things that can be done um, to uh, mitigate um, forest cover loss and try to, to, um, to be proactive about forest conservation. This is one that has been mentioned quite a lot in the literature. Uh, let's try to reduce the dependency of, uh, of people on forests. Uh, so provisioning pressure, let's try to remove this provision, or not remove, but reduce this provision, provisioning uh, pressure, meaning people going into the forest and taking, pro uh, um, taking wood for um, various needs. So uh, one solution is alternative sources of building. Uh, in this case, a picture of bamboo, a bamboo, a planted bamboo forest. Uh, you can have an ag land that becomes a bamboo forest, I guess. Uh, and then um, alternative, uh, uh, alternative sources for fuel and also more efficient uh, uh, stoves. And this is a, an area I think conser um, some conservation organizations are pretty strong on this message. Let's improve the efficiency of the stoves that are used by, by uh, people to uh, cook and, and warm themselves up. Okay, uh, any questions? Other solutions, sustainable forests that have minimal road building, have selective logging, so maybe um, uh, minimizing the chances of creating drier forests, uh, small clear cuts, uh, and trying to replant at the same time as the logging uh, goes on, instead of just moving on from one logging uh, uh, concession to another. Uh, there are products that are uh, certified as, as sustainable. Um, there are organizations that are dealing with this. So this is an area of uh, conservation um, that is flourishing and developing. And we can now see these, uh, these steps of sustainable development uh, on many products. Okay, so la lastly, um, to end in a very uh, cheerful note, uh, not at all cheerful, uh, this uh, clearing of forests for uh, oil palm uh, plantation. This, at least for uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, this is, this is a very serious problem, but I've heard from, uh, well, at least from one student from Colombia, I heard that this is becoming a problem in Colombia as well. So other countries are moving towards, and I see hands up, are moving towards uh, yes, using oil palm. A lot of Western adding, Central Africa. Adding countries and countries. Um, in uh, Mal Indonesia and Malaysia, the oil palm um, plantations have been, uh, I think, um, at least we'll see a remote sensing study. Uh, this issue has been studied uh, uh, recently quite intensively. And I put just a list of, of products that are used from... Um, uh, oil palms, and you see there are a lot of products, a lot of uses, uh, which is why for the, from this tree, which is why I think it has such a high, um, it's su in such high demand. Now, if we have an ag land that becomes an oil palm, oil, oil palm plantation, it's not so bad because I think um, we can argue again that we are sequestering some of the carbon. I don't know. Uh, it could be positive unless. It could be positive, but with uh, forest cover loss, it is definitely a negative, uh, a negative, uh, uh, it has a negative effect on, on the system. So, really bad things, I think, uh, concerning, a concerning trend, I would say. This is a concerning trend, and I don't have, I don't think I put the, oh, I put the study here. I don't have the graph that shows the price of uh, palm oil, that it has gone, uh, it has increased on the international market and the trading um, market, I guess. The price of um, palm oil uh, has increased uh, quite significant, significantly in the last uh, 10 years or so, and that, that uh, creates the incentive of planting more uh, oil palm uh, trees, I guess, palms, there are palms. Okay, so this is the study I, I mentioned. This was published in 2013. 
And what this study did was to look at deforestation that has occurred, um, or I should say uh, oil, pla uh, oil palm plantations that have uh, developed since uh, starting 1990 all the way to 2010. So in um, 10 years, 1990, 1990 to 2000, and then 2000 to 2010. It also shows you the soil type bec because they were interested in the soil type. But looking just at the colors, what we see is uh, more darker blue and black, meaning recently, in the last 10 to 15 years, the uh, oil palm plantations have increased in area, uh, in, um, unfortunately, in, in this part of the world. And then the second figure, this figure, shows the uh, leases that the government has, has given out. Um, let's see, so, I have to remember, oh yes, so oil palm leases, oh, these are based on uh, where exactly they are. But what I would like you to, to reflect on is the amount of, of leases. So if we compare this map to this map, pretty much everything is a possible lease for oil uh, uh, palm plantations. And this is as of 2003, uh, 2013. This doesn't mean that the plantations are, are there but it just means that the um, possibility is there and the incentive, the governmental uh, incentive is there to further develop the uh, oil palm uh, uh, industry, I guess I would call it. Okay, um, lastly, I think this is my last, that my last slide. I wanted to mention um, the, um, what the conservation planning can, uh, the type of information that conservation planning can use. Uh, specifically uh, scenarios of future land use. Um, recently, as a, I think two years ago, United States um, released its own um, scenario of land use changes um, for 2050 and 2080, I think. Uh, and this is a global um, uh, land use, uh, I wouldn't call it change, land use scenarios um, for uh, future decades. It's a tool to use, just like uh, just like uh, scenarios of uh, global uh, global climate uh, changes, with the caveat that a lot of the issues, for example, uh, fire frequency, um, incentive for plantations and whatnot, those it's those kinds of um, uh, factors are hard to be included. It's hard to include those kinds of factors in these scenarios. But it's a start. I would say it's a start that. Um, and these are data that I think are useful, um, informative uh, to us uh, conservation biologists. And I think, oh, okay, this, this is really my last <laughs> slide. Okay, so the last slide, I thought, how to put this, how to summarize all, this, um, all these uh, threats and the, the kinds of reaction we, we, have, we, we may have to these threats. So uh, first thing, we can, one thing we can do is resist change. Um, and we try to maintain the unaltered ecosystems, whether we are trying to mitigate for climate change, uh, land use change, uh, invasive species. So we are trying to resist change. The second, uh, alter the second option or possibility is to mitigate change. So think of, as, as the land becomes more fragmented, we, uh, because of um, land use changes, we, uh, we uh, plan more for corridors to, to connect the, uh, uh, the fragments. We also could think of having protected areas that have mixed habitats to have more, uh, more diversity of habitats and higher likelihood of, of uh, protecting um, diverse uh, communities. And then this is an interesting one, assisted migration has been proposed um, more frequently in recent years. And it started with just the mic um, um, translocation. So initially it was called translocation uh, we, uh, or reintroduction. Translocation or reintroduction. We reintroduce a species uh, in an area that uh, historically has been present. Or translocation, we move a species, a population I should say, from an area that has become the land use has changed, for example, there is human encroachment, we move that population, we translocate that population to a, a new area that is uh, now suitable, or it is still suitable for the species. 
Assisted migration, maybe, uh, maybe Lee would mention it. Uh, th this particular term refers to assisting species to migrate in face or uh, in uh, light of climate change. But this is um, this topic is of I think of uh, debate as well in the literature because we can think of moving species as similarly to introducing species. So the argument against against this type of management decision, uh, translocation of species, is that we are now introducing a species into a, an area and we are changing the interactions and whatnot, uh, the um, ecosystem uh, functions in that particular region. But anyways, this is, these are ways to mitigate forest loss. Um, well, I don't know about invasive species. I didn't put invasive species here. Uh, but for us last, and maybe Lee will talk about climate change. And then the third one is, so we resist change, we mitigate, we do something about change. And then the third one is just accept it, embrace it, um, where we have species losses, and um, yeah, where, where we decide it's time to give up. And again, this is another, another uh, heated debate or, or difficult, difficult discussion to have in co conservation, giving up when you decide this is a lost cause, we might as well move on, let this go, uh, you know, let a species go extinct and let the habitat change. But accepting change where the species losses are expected uh, and think about novel, novel ecosystems. And this goes back to the little uh, debate I had with the director of the Ethiopian Biodiversity Institute where he was, ad not advocated, he was, he was talking about uh, ecosystem collapse. And I said, mm, I don't really, I don't really follow, uh, not follow, I don't really think there's enough evidence for this idea of ecosystem collapses. It's more like transitioning into something else, not necessarily what we want. Uh, and in literature, uh, more and more we see this uh, novel ecosystem uh, terminology. And again, this is not accepted terminology. Uh, we have different reactions to this to this idea of novel ecosystems. Okay, that's it. I will stop. If there are any questions, uh, let me know. Okay.